this story coming out of France, <clears throat> which is interesting, and that is, uh, and distressing, I think, potentially distressing, and that is the arrest of, um, uh, of the founder and CEO of Telegram, the, uh, the app, the, uh, the, the communications app, uh, Pavel Durov uh, was arrested, I guess, over the weekend in, in France. He flew in there on a private jet from Azerbaijan. Um, uh, Pavel uh, Durov lives in Dubai. Uh, he has uh, <clears throat> Dubai as well as French uh, citizenship. He is orig originally Russian. I, I'm, I'm getting conflicting info. In some places I've read that he gave up his uh, Russian citizenship. Um, other places don't mention that uh, and, and treat him as if he's a national, a Russian national. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But he's definitely got a uh, UAE and a French uh, United Arab Emirate, which Dubai is part of, and a French uh, citizenship passport. And he was arrested in France at the Paris airport. Uh, it, Durov has an interesting history. I mean, he founded a company called, I can't pronounce this, Vekontakte, Vekontakte, Vekontakte. It's a Russian word with contact in it. So uh, basically, Vekontakte was a rival to Facebook. And um, uh, it, 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 he, he launched it. it. It became bigger than Facebook in Russia. And um, he got... He got uh, in, in trouble with the um, Putin administration over content on this, and he landed up, I guess, losing control of it. it not clear exactly what happened there, but uh, selling it, giving it away, but he lost, he lost control over uh, that entity in 2014. In 2013, he started a... Um, a um, I guess it's like Twitter, uh, like a messaging app uh, uh, called Telegram. Uh, I have a Telegram account. I don't know if you guys have a Telegram account, uh, accounts, but uh, Telegram is is incredibly valuable resource. We'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, he founded Telegram. Telegram is a um, uh, uncensored, completely uh, secure method of communication. So it's, uh, um, uh, everything is encrypted from, from end to end encryption. Uh, it supposedly cannot be hacked. Uh, it is about as secure as you can get in terms of, uh, communicating, uh, as a communication to tool. It's been pitched as a way, uh, in which, um, uh, People who are opposed to different regimes, uh, you, you know, the, the, the way which people opposed to different regimes and oppositions in authoritarian states can communicate, uh, they cannot be hacked, they cannot be accessed, you can stay anonymous on it, uh, and supposedly it really is, um, has not been uh, hacked. Again, this was, uh, he founded this in 2013. Um, when um, the whole issue with his Facebook-like um, entity came into being, he, um, he actually left Russia. He moved to Dubai and he moved Telegram uh, to Dubai. He, he, he got Telegram established in Dubai. Um, at some point, he, um, <laughs> in, uh, when was this, in... Uh, after, so after he left Russia in 2014, he uh, traveled to Berlin, San Francisco, London, Singapore, and other cities before he decided to make uh, Dubai the headquarters for Telegram. Um, Russia, at some point, decided to uh, try to ban uh, Telegram because it was being used by people uh, in the opposition. Uh, dissenting voices were using Telegram, and it was outside of the control. It couldn't be hacked by the Russian authorities. So they tried to ban it which is interesting given, given uh, their response today. But anyway, they tried to ban it. Um, and um, uh, it, very hard to ban. It's an app that you can get on your phone and then use. And uh, 
there are very, very few things that a government can do to stop you from using, uh, from using the app, but the reality is that it was banned in, in Russia for a long time. It was found upon. Um, and then uh, that ban eased somewhere around 2020 when uh, some executives from the company w went to Russia, um, were on a tech panel with Russia's prime minister, and had some conversations with the Russians, and the Russians basically reinstated the app in 2020. Again, they, they banned it, and then they, in 2020, uh, they reinstated it. In, in April 2018, Russian authorities tried to block access to Telegram. It wasn't very effective, but they opened access in 2020. Since then, since they opened their access, Telegram has been one of the primary ways of communication in Russia for the opposition, but also, it turns out, for government entities, both for government um, security forces. Uh, many people are arguing that the war in Ukraine is being run on Telegram. That is, that, that orders and uh, assignments and uh, uh, intelligence assessments all being reported, all being communicated by Telegram because it is such a secure platform. Uh, indeed, Telegram is also used by the Ukrainians for similar uh, purpose. I get a lot of my up-to-date, minute-by-minute news about what is going on in Israel uh, from a Telegram, from a couple of Telegram channels um, on, um, yeah, a couple of Telegram channels uh, from Israel. So um, it, it is a channel that's heavily used. It's heavily used in uh, war zones. It's heavily used by opposition parties. It's heavily used in authoritarian states. Very difficult to regulate, very difficult to control. And you can imagine that there's a consequence of the fact that it's so difficult to penetrate. It's so difficult to control. It's so difficult to limit. Uh, this is the preferred platform of every bad guy out there in the world, I assume, right? So you could imagine the drug dealers and uh, weapons dealers and, I don't know, uh, secret services and uh, CIA-like entities that, um, um, that are out there uh, uh, working for bad actors all using Telegram. There is another, there's a competitor called Signal, which is a competitor to Telegram, but Telegram is... Um, is probably the main player in this space, and everybody is using it. Um, Telegram prides itself on not doing any real moderation, although they claim that they are biting by uh, moderation laws established by the EU. It seems like there's a bit of a, a contradiction there, uh, but it does seem like a place. So, for example, um, you can find a lot of the videos that people would not show after October 7th, like the, the terrorist videos that they took from the uh, 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 pro-cams. Uh, you can find a, those, a lot of those videos that, uh, uh, that Facebook and Twitter and all these other channels won't show. You can find them on Telegram. Again, you can find coverage, uh, uncensored coverage of various conflicts on Telegram. It's a, it's a phenomenal news source. Again, I use it for particularly Israel. I also used it at the beginning of the Ukraine war there were some uh, there were some Telegram channels that you could uh, that you could get in English that from Ukrainians about what was going on on a daily basis. It's also true that a lot of the information we get about conflict inside Russia about what's going on with the Ukraine war comes from dissenters on Telegram. There's also uh, uh, there are also um, mill channels, military channels on Telegram. These are Russians that talk about military issues in Russian on Telegram. And then the people like on Twitter who will translate that and then publish, I follow people like that. So it's, it's how you get information that's not filtered through the mainstream media, that, but it's also could be complete BS. So you have to judge whether it's true or not, but it's how you get raw information uh, uh, from a variety of different places around the world where it's difficult to get that information directly. Anyway, over the weekend, Pavel Durov was arrested in France 
Uh, he, uh, it's not clear the basis for the arrest. We will find out in the next few days, I guess. They can't hold him for very long. They've got a, a French law. They can hold him for 24 hours. And then based on, I guess, what they discovered during the 24 hours, they can hold him for a maximum 96 more hours before they have to formally charge him. So right now he's in the 96 hour period. He passed the 24 hour, they extended it. There's a lot of speculation. It could be that he is being accused uh, or, or that the platform is being used by terrorists, drug dealers, arm dealers, and that he is not doing based on EU law the necessary stuff to restrict the use by those actors. Um, it's not clear exactly what exactly he could do given the encrypted nature of all of this. I don't know enough about this, but uh, this is one accusation. Um, uh, you know, so, so there are laws in the EU that says you can't use a social media platform or responsible, I guess, for how your platform is used, for, for, for if it's being used for terrorist attacks, you can be accused under French law um, uh, for, uh, for, for, for terrorist attacks. Um, uh, if, um, so that's one theory, is it's all about criminal activity on the platform. The second, the second uh, possibility is that uh, there's some, this is going to be, he's going to be accused of some kind of espionage, maybe helping the Russians. Uh, even though Russia tried to ban Telegram, supposedly this cozy relationship between Telegram and the Russians now. And it's also, there's rumors, although they've been denied, that Pavel was just in uh, Azerbaijan. He was just in Azerbaijan. He flew to Paris from Azerbaijan. But the rumor is that he met Putin in Azerbaijan. Who the hell knows if that's true? Probably not. But uh, maybe he's being accused by the French of some kind of national security. Maybe he accused of spying for the Russians and working for the Russians. I, I do not know. Uh, but this has become a huge focus of uh, the free speech debate. Um, you know, Elon Musk has come out uh, demanding that he be released and accusing the uh, European Union of censorship, again, before we even know what he's been accused of. It's a question of whether you can hold the person who has the platform responsible for the communication that happened on the platform. Can we hold AT&T responsible for the crimes committed by people communicating about those crimes on the AT&T platform, on the AT&T phones? The answer to that is no, I don't think. And yet, there's an assumption that on social media you can. At least the EU assumes that. I don't know what the U.S. stance is. I think the U.S., uh, particularly with Section 230, I think the U.S., you cannot go after the platforms uh, for communication that happens in secret by people on the platform. Uh, but Europe has a lot of misinformation laws, moderation laws, all kinds of things like that. They're trying to go after Elon Musk because of these things, and maybe this is their way of, of sending a warning signal out there. Um, if that's the case, this is very bad. If that's the case, Europe, which is already very weak on free speech and, 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 and very bad on these issues, this is a next step towards an abyss. This is really, you know, you're going to accuse the CEO of a communications platform you can accuse him of crimes for allowing crimes to be, I guess, coordinated on your platform. I mean, that seems ridiculous. And again, particularly given the, uh, um, uh, the nature of this platform where Telegram itself doesn't have access to the messages. The messages are encrypted. Um, so Telegram itself is not monitoring those things. Now, maybe... Maybe there's some idea of monitoring based on some keywords or based on, but there are ways to get around that. Um, Russia is panicking. Uh, Russia is panicking because the reality is the telegram is used by their intelligence services and is used by their military. They're very, very scared that um, 
that Pavel Durov is going to hand the French access to the encryption key to all this Russian information, all this Russian intelligence information. Again, I don't know enough about Telegram and the way it works. Maybe some of you do on the chat. Maybe you guys know more about the, the, the technical aspects of it. Can you access all the messages? Are they saved or is it peer-to-peer -peer and it's, it's erased once? I, I don't know. I mean, um, but the reality is that the Russians are panicking and they're worried about the fact that uh, some of the encrypted information gets into the hands of uh, the enemies of Russia or as they perceive them, the enemy of Russia, that their French are using this arrest of Durov or this, um, uh, yeah, the arrest of Durov as a way to squeeze Telegram to give them information or to open up a, a back door into uh, the encrypted channel so they can get that information. Um, uh, yeah, David Arsenault, who's, uh, who's a tech guy, uh, says Telegram is not secure by default, and even the secure chat uses some questionable encryption. That's interesting, because I thought Telegram was the most encrypted of all the platforms. So there we go. I, I was wrong. I trust David to know more about this than I am. Um, but anyway, the Russians are afraid. Obviously, there's access into the Telegram platform, and they're worried that that access um, is, uh, will be given to enemies of the Kremlin, enemies of, uh, of the Russians. Anyway, this, is, this has national security implications for the Ukraine, particularly for the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Uh, this has free speech issues. Uh, is Europe going to stamp down on it because, uh, I don't know, there was hate speech expressed on Telegram and therefore uh, the EU is going to arrest the CEO of Telegram. It has implications to how do we deal with a platform on which, let's say, illegal activity is being coordinated. It, can we arrest the CEO for that? It has a lot of implications for freedom and liberty. Um, I mean, my default is no, I mean, having a platform is not violating anybody's rights. Somebody using my platform where I've said I'm not moderating, I'm not intervening, to do something negative is not my responsibility. It's their responsibility. So the use of the platform does not create liability. Uh, I believe that is true. I think that's fundamental to freedom and, uh, and, and, and liberty. You cannot... Um, you, you cannot charge me for something that I, I have no responsibility and no control over. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, that's going to be a big issue and it's, we're going we're gonna to see what the French actually charge him with. And then the Russians are also panicking about what if Telegram just crashes? What if, they, what if the deal here is they just shut down Telegram and suddenly this vital means of communication between Russian troops has disappears just vanishes. Um, anyway, uh, a lot of unknowns, a lot up in the air, really, really interesting. The technology is interesting. The story is interesting. The politics of it are interesting. Uh, uh, Macron has come out and said, this is not a political move. I had nothing to do with this. This is the independence of the judiciary. This is a judge in, um, in the French legal system. A, a, a judge puts out a warrant, a judge investigates, they have investigative judges. Uh, a judge is not just an impartial, um, but a judge has, goes out and investigates crimes. And uh, this is a judge's, uh, a judge's decision, and uh, supposedly it has no political implications. We will see. Uh, the Russians are objecting officially, the Russian government, funny, for a government that basically tried to shut down this platform just a few years ago. Also funny that they are defending um, uh, uh, Durov, even though, at least by some accounts, Durov has given up his Russian citizenship and was quite opposed, is quite opposed to the Putin regime. But maybe not. Maybe, uh, in this case, maybe Durov uh, has come to some kind of alignment with Putin. Maybe he did meet with him in Azerbaijan. Who knows is the point. There's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty. Anyway, interesting, and uh, 
a lot of chat on social media because a lot of people are concerned that this is a free speech issue, which it might be. I mean, Europe, as we've talked about many times, not exactly a uh, bastion of, uh, of free speech. So.